Um, today, we got my friend Mike Crenshaw on the episode with us. A lot of you that have listened to my story so far know that before I got into the motorcycle scene, I grew up in the punk rock and skinhead world. Um, and an era before mine was Mike. So Mike grew up in that same in that same scene. Um, you know, obviously his story is a little different, but we have quite a bit of overlap. So we're going to go over that today. So welcome to the show, Mike. Hey, what's up, Justin? Yeah. So um, tell everybody a little bit about, so if, if people don't know what the word skinhead is, how do you normally describe it to people? There was a many, uh, many years in my life where I just stopped describing it to people. The first tattoo I ever got says skinhead. Uh, I got it probably like 1986 or something. And over the years, the sun has bleached it out. There was a period of about 20 years when I was glad the sun had uh, made the letters fade to where nobody could read it because right. I just got right. tired of trying to explain to people. It's like, and now Jesus, imagine nowadays, it's like, this is back before cell phones and shit. So like, um, people had a, you know, bigger attention span, but now motherfuckers don't want to hear that, right. <laughs> trying to explain it, like, you know, but, but yeah, so to me, skinhead is, is a lot of different things, bro. You know, it's like, it's a street culture. It's a subculture. It, it it was adjacent and intersected with the punk movement, but in some ways, it's older than the punk movement because Absolutely. it came it came out of mods and rude boys mixing together, and rude boys being black Jamaican immigrant youth uh, who were into the ska music and dressing real nice, and intermixing with working class kids in England and uh, mostly white kids in England and. Those two cultures created the skinhead culture. But later, uh, a couple decades later, when there was a resurgence of the culture, it was split because England was going through some economic crisis similar to what we're going through and have been through in the United States, you know? Um, it, it's like a cycle. It's like the economy gets bad. Uh, you get people looking for a scapegoat someone to blame they blame the immigrants they blame people of color you know whatever it is so england was going through its own situation like that in the 70s and that's when the skinhead movement got split because a lot of working white class working class white folks were angry and they wanted to blame their problems on people from other countries and so that's where the racism started to kind of show up in the move in part of the movement and that half was went with the National Front and the British movement and became fascist, Nazi skinheads. And then there were those who remained true to the original flavor of the movement. Right. And and that's, you know, that's what you and I aligned with was that original movement. So what right. initially attracted you to the skinhead scene or how did you even get introduced to it? You know, I was I was a punk kid and being growing up, you know, the early part of my life, I lived on the south side of Chicago. Everybody was black. You know, I didn't really see white people unless they're in positions of authority or we went to a part of town where white people were. And then we moved around a lot too. So we moved, we lived in Joliet, Illinois. Um, we lived in Springfield for a minute, but when I was in some of those smaller communities, we'd be the only black kids. My brother and I would be the only black kids in some of the schools we went to. So there was this thing that went back and forth. I come back to the hood in Chicago and they'd be like, man, you talk like you're white. I can't believe you listen to that music. And then I go, you know, white kids didn't understand any, or respect, you know, the blackness that was part of who I am. You know, I can't change that. So it, after a while, I got tired of trying to fit in, um, moving around a lot. And it was the punk kids that I fit in with because right. they were like, fuck trying to fit in. And it, and it wasn't like this timid, like meek thing. Like punk kids were like, yeah, we don't fit in and we're proud of it. And so when I started like checking out the punk scene, first I was fascinated. Actually, I was attracted. I was attracted to punk girls, man. Yeah, you know, I thought they, I thought they looked just dope. And, <laughs> you know, the fishnets and the skirts and the, the eyeliner and the hair. And I was like, I wonder if I I wonder if if I get involved with punk, if I could meet a girl like that, you know, and the music I like, I've been introduced to heavy metal with some kids I was hanging out with in um, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, big shout out to Matt Henderson, who went on to play with Agnostic Front and uh, Madball, H2O as well. But anyway, I uh, the music and the style was what spoke to me. And as the music and the style was speaking to me, some of my friends, I went through a period where I got clean and sober um, in high school, because I was just doing too much. And my friends that I wound up hanging out with were straight edge. 
and it was a tight group of uh, young guys, and uh, a couple of them were like, "Let's let's be skinheads," you know. And I was like, "What is that?" You know. And so we started. We got the book. One of the homies had that book, "Skinhead" by Nick Knight. Yeah. We started flipping through the pictures and understanding the dress style and the uniform. Because back then there was two types of skinheads, aesthetically, more. So, not so much the Nazi bonehead or or anti-racist in the early, you know, in the mid '80s for us, it was like there was American skinheads who were basically just bald punks. Right. You know, they didn't they didn't wear doc. They just wear some combat boots and even tuck their pants in, you know, and they just had bald heads and they would be in the pit and they'd be more aggressive than everybody else. But then. The traditional skinhead dress is different, and that that's like staying true to the English style. Right. And so we started getting the boots and the brace. We got our docks back then. You had to order docks from over, either order them from New York or order them direct from London, you know, and um, fill out a money order and do all this this whole waiting game for weeks until your shoes showed up and you hoped that they fit correctly and right. break, you know, breaking them, suck them brand new docks, make, made a mistake of wearing brand new knock brand new docks uh to go kick it and you know your kids like a couple of us had cars but for a while we walked everywhere yeah for sure and i, I remember, remember the end of the night that squeaky sound of those breaking in a pair of doc martins <laughs> that blister on your achilles heel you know Brutal. so yeah we, we we started you know there were seven of us at first we called ourselves the baldies because um we didn't know what name we're thinking like we gotta get a name for our crew, you know. We're thinking the Undertaker sounds dope, but you know it turns out that there was this older street gang culture in in the United States, and there were Baldi's gangs in certain cities. And Minneapolis actually had a Baldi's gang, really. Um, yeah, and they weren't exclusively white. So it turns out one of the uh, Frank Atlas shout out to him. He was a black Baldi, black Minneapolis Baldi back in the fifties and sixties. And it's funny because he was a neighbor of mine and he would catch me coming and going. And he he just knew. He was like, hey, man, I see what you're doing. You know, you're going to be dead or in jail if you keep it up. Right. You know, I was once just like you. And, you know, so. Uh, but, yeah, we, shortly after we we clicked up, the Nazis started to show up because they were take a lot of kids were copying what they were seeing on the TV shows. And that's what made the Nazi shit popular at that time to our perception for teenagers who wanted to be tough. And then we started organizing and fighting against them. And that was the beginning of our movement. Yeah. Okay, cool. And how long uh, were you in Minneapolis in the Baldy scene? Or we started Baldi? around 86, 87. And then we, we expanded, made allegiances with other crews and whatnot. Ultimately we formed the syndicate and uh, anti-racist action. So I was active from about 86 till about 90. Then I came to Portland for the first time, met all the sharps. Yeah, that's to- what next is what, what brought you to Portland? You know, my mom moved out here with my little sister when she divorced um, my stepdad. And so her and my sister came out here. Then my brother came out here. We were all in Minnesota. I came and visited. I liked it. And it, it just turns out the uh, the lifestyle I was living in Minneapolis, violence and addiction was like pretty central to just everyday activity or weekly. So like I I got into so many fights with folks. I started to feel like the walls were closing in and that some of the things I'd done to other people were going to get done to me. Yeah, that and, makes sense, man. Yeah, man. You know, and um so I was like, let me let me let me change it up. Let me see what happens if I allow myself to be in a different environment. And what I loved about out here, not only were the homies cool to me when I got here, because they had met some baldies uh, a year or two earlier that actually helped them work on some things out here. So the homies were here for sure, but it was the land. It was like the fact that I could get to the ocean, get to the mountains, get to the forest. And that just changed my whole game. I was like, I got more appreciative of life. Culturally, what was it like compared to Minneapolis? I mean, is it, you know, being at Oregon is, you know, so, so heavily just pretty much white people, right? Like the great white North and all those things you hear and the old laws and and Portland and stuff that are focused on white folks. Was it like that in Minneapolis or was it a pretty big culture shift? What's a trip is it was, it was, you know, it's subtle. So like at the time in the eighties, Minneapolis, there was a time in the eighties where demographically 
unfortunately, Minneapolis was the whitest city in America. Um, and then it switched to Portland and then it went to Omaha. So that figure jumps around depending on, you know, demographic patterns. But I was used because of the way I grew up going back and forth a lot. I was used to being around white folks. Um, Minneapolis is way more diverse now than it was in the 80s, you know, uh, and it's always been more diverse than Portland. But that said, being in the punk scene and whatnot, I was I wasn't really tripping on the fact that Portland was super white. I did miss the diversity of, of being at home, like in the Baldies, you know, at, at the house in Minneapolis, it was like five or six, seven, eight black skinheads. You know, people moved up from Chicago and whatnot. Out here, there was only one other, uh, the homie John was the only other black skinhead around at that time. Right. Um, you know, and so eventually after I got settled here, I had to make a choice. I, it was like, do I want to, because a lot of these guys really wanted me to be active out here. And I was like going through kind of a transition where I didn't want to be active in terms of like inviting violence into my life. Um, and so I started to kind of like, I've been doing hip hop since I was a kid, just as a habit, like learning freestyle rhyming for fun. But I started going to hip hop shows and, and like trying to connect with people in the scene. And that's how I kind of transitioned away from like just drinking and partying and going and looking for people to fight. How different was that crossover in scenes? I mean, Portland's not that big, right? So there had to be some sort of overlap. So how different was that going from like punk rock skinhead scene to the hip hop scene or underground hip hop scene? Well, what's the trip? So like when, when, when I used to kick it out here with the Sharps, you know, we would go to the, the Safeway to get some beer or whatever. I remember this one time we went to Safeway up there on uh, MLK in Ainsworth. And it was me and like four uh, of the Sharps and they got jumped. There were some crips in the parking lot. They weren't having it. And they were like trying to tell them like, we're not <laughs> Nazis. And I'm standing there and they're not even paying attention to me. I'm like, I'm right. with them. we're going to get beer. You know? and it's hard it's hard to be mad at them for that right like yeah like where they, they were coming from we back it we were on the same page but you just wish so they'd hear that out right <laughs> yep you know so if they were to have been nazis i would have been happy to see that happen i would have helped them out but it wasn't yep. the case uh you know so it it was a trip to me like this intersection and i know this is something you talked about like this intersection between subculture and gangs and they're not entirely the same but sometimes they intersect right and so Right. There's there there's part of the skinhead scene that looks like a gang, walks like a gang, organizes like a gang, but then there's a larger part of it that's really just a subculture. For and sure. so, to me, growing up, I was buying hip hop records and punk records at the same time when I would go to the record store. To me, the street element, the working class street element of do it yourself. This is our culture aspects of it might become you know commercially viable at some point but this is this is from the streets to me that was the intersection between punk and hip-hop for sure and you, you know? see that a lot in new york too right i mean beastie boys did that you know there was a lot of that overlap in that early you know 80s and 90s era for sure exactly so a, you know when when i made inroads into the hip-hop scene here you know in my heart i'm gonna always be a skinhead you know but i also there are other ways that i express myself as well so I, I ended up, you know, I got in the skinhead scene in 96. So I think, you know, like you said, you kind of already started stepping out around then. Um, and I didn't end up joining Rose City until 2001. So what was that like 1990s Portland skinhead scene like? Because wasn't there like a lot of different crews for a minute before Rose City formed? And Yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't keep it. I don't I don't I didn't know the timeline like the guys who lived here. So my guys were all Portland sharp and there was a, a handful of Portland sharp that wanted to become baldies so they were asking me if i would give them the green light and i was reluctant because i was like man i don't know that that's the right move like and i definitely don't want to have to micromanage or be in some type of uh leadership position where i feel responsible for what you guys are doing you know but after milling over it for a minute i put uh one of the og baldies john i put him in touch with uh one of my ogs you know a guy who who formed the baldies with me gator and those two chopped it up and they they were like gator was like yeah by all means you guys can can start a chapter out there and so then there was a split you know because there were guys in portland that 
were all part of the sharp scene that wanted to become Portland United Baldies. And then there were guys who were like, we need to have our own, you know, we can't copy. We need to be proud of who we are. And it, it was, it was difficult for me because I was friends with all of them. Right. They were all the homies to me. And I understood each side and respected everyone. But uh, eventually some cats became Rose City and some cats became Portland United Baldies. And I got, all those dudes are, are still like my brothers to this day, you know? For sure. But that's what that's what I saw. I didn't see a lot of boneheads, man. There were a couple of times like I would jump out on them, but honestly, I see more boneheads today than I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, I believe that for sure. I know when I moved up there, I think we were we were pretty hot with Hammerskins initially, um, mm. ran them out, and then Volksfront started having a pretty good big reemergence in my era. Um, yeah. It wasn't like that they were going to our concerts very often it wasn't like that bleed over like probably from your era where they were just out and about but they were out there we definitely clashed with them quite a bit um yeah i think yeah. there was that overlap i think the big difference from my era versus yours is that the generation of rose city i joined there was one and one only skinhead group in town and if you were going to be anything else then we had beef with you too regardless if you were racist or anti-racist and i think that's where it goes to a lot of that gang overlap that you talked about exactly. early, for sure you know one of the things yeah. that the older heads told me when I first joined is this is pretty much a neighborhood outside of we don't profit off of what we do and no one's there, you know, there's not a hustle in here, but the rest of it's a neighborhood, you know, and that's pretty much how we ran it. That's right. And that there's a lot of crossover between, cause I noticed like venturing into outlaw motorcycle culture, you know, a lot of skinheads became one percenters. Absolutely. You know? The ton from, from all, from both sides of the fence. Right. Exactly. Uh, I tell people that a lot too. It's really interesting. So, you know, different clubs dislike other clubs and, and, you know, I get it. I've been in long enough to understand why, but if you mm -hmm. boil it all down, it's probably just like the skinhead scene was it would probably, you know, even if it's racist versus not racist, it's really who was around you culturally when you were coming up. Right. So, you know, if you grew up in the skinhead scene in Northern California, you likely went to the angels. And if you grew up in the Midwest, you probably went to the outlaws, but it was like, you know what I mean? We all probably came from a lot of the similar experiences, had did a lot of the same things, listened to the same music, and we went with what was in our area. Um, and you know, when it boils down to it, it's a lot of the same people. And, and that's the unfortunate fact I think about a lot of racist skinheads too, is sometimes those dudes had bad influences around them when they got into punk rock or whatever, and they went that way, where we went this way. Um, and I think, I think that gets forgotten quite a bit, you know, because when you just see enemy, you just see red and you don't think of the person. But a lot of times I think, you know, in reality, a lot of us came from the same place. Yeah, we did. And I think like, you know, there's this this uh, Nip, Nipsey Hussle quote where he's talking about when he was out looking for his enemies, he wouldn't look for people that look different. He would see a dude that walked like him, you know, that had style like him, same swag and everything. And he would know, OK, that's that's my op right there. Right. And yeah, it's the same weird. thing. Like if you look at what underlies all this stuff, um, it, it's the desire to be part of something that's bigger than you. And part of something where everybody in that organization is going to have your back. Absolutely. Right? And so you stand for that and you, you have to accept everything that goes with it. And whether or not people, whatever people's ideological or racial orientation is, that's the core of what we're dealing with. Right. And that's why it can be uh, like a, a second family for a lot of people. But that's also why it can be really dangerous because you have to accept the whatever the whatever the beef that was going on before you became part of the organization now you have to take that you have to internalize that and stand for that yeah and that's huge in the biker world too obviously you know but yep. big overlap between the two um so with that so what what got you into motorcycles how did you go from you know the skinhead to hip-hop to motorcycles you know my uncle's rode when i was a kid so i i would either be on the back of their bikes or watching them pull up you know, and one of my uncles was an outlaw. Um, he was an outlaw club, a black outlaw club in Chicago. Um, so I want to clarify when I say outlaw, I don't mean he was an outlaws MC. He was in a diamond club in right. Chicago. And um, so when I was a little boy, I would see him pull up on his Harley with his rags on. And I just thought it was the baddest thing. It right. was like a mixture between Jimi Hendrix and like a gunslinger from a Western movie. That's why we was in my imagination. So, and the rest of my uncles all had Kawasaki's, but when I, you know, my brother, his first bike, he got a Japanese street bike. But when it was time for me to get my first bike, I, I knew I wanted a Harley. And right around the time, I was having a tough time figuring out what I wanted to do. You know, there are times in my life where I've had a tough time figuring out what I wanted to do. 
And that kind of anxiety and stress and uncertainty has always led to a breakthrough. Absolutely. And I was, I was putting up some flyers for a hip hop show on a pole and I looked across the street at the old rebel skates building and I saw some brothers and they had, you know, they had hogs and they had patches. And so I went over to talk to them and it turns out that that was another old homie, a dude I met in 93. And they yeah. were with a I know you're talking about, I remember that exact, <laughs> I remember when he bought that building. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I fell in right away. I was like, what do I got to do to be down? And, you know, the homie was like, first you need a bike. So I started looking for bikes and that's when I bought my first, uh, Harley in what was 2011. It? What was your first bike? Uh, just a Dyna Street Bob, you know, I think 93 cubic inches. I kept it pretty stock for a while. It took me a while. It's I'm still learning. I'm on my third bike. You know, I just bought the ST. You got an ST. Yeah. But now yeah. I'm like more comfortable ex accessorizing it. And finally, I'd never done. I'd only done stage two on my first two bikes. Finally, uh, went to Cycle Tune doing stage four on this one. So I'm stoked. Badass. Yeah, I saw Tom's doing some big board kit on his stuff, too. Yeah, we did. We, we bought the same kit and we're getting it, you know, installed through the same dude that's helping us out. So when, when I was, uh, you know, ready to step away from the skinhead scene and, and you know, for, for various reasons, but I was ready for a change. Um, you know, I, I started riding Vespas when I was in the skinhead scene. I was big in Portland, you know, and I know a lot of people laugh at that. But if you were in that era, we thought it was cool, right? It was cool. It was I had a good ass time on it. But that mm -hmm. then took me to a lot of dudes riding and some of the older guys in Rose City were riding, but they were riding like sport bikes and crotch rockets. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, but when I got into Harley's that's what pulled me out of the skinhead scene really, you know, because it gave me something else to really focus on. And I've always been that guy that like, when I do something, I want to be in, in the biggest or the best part of it. Right. Like when I was a skinhead, mm -hmm. I wanted to be in the city cause I was the best crew in, in the Northwest. And when I started riding, I was like, yeah, I want to be in a, in a club, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, so I get, I, I guess my, my point is I understand that parallel cause it seems very similar. Like yours was a little later on, but there's still that same, like that draw of, this is really similar to what I'm used to, but it's also very different. So there's the excitement of the difference, but there's also that comfort of the brotherhood and the gang aspect. And like, you know, all that's all, I shouldn't say the word gang, but you know what I'm saying? Like the, the togetherness mm -hmm. things together. Mm -hmm. So I think it was like familiarity to it, but it was also like that, that like mystique when we grew up is like, Ooh, bikers are crazy. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, mm -hmm. kind of like as you go. Yeah, man. Where, I mean, I'm always attracted to something that feels exclusive. If it has the right aesthetics, you know, absolutely. And so the, the curiosity growing up and hearing all the folklore about bikers, the curiosity was always like, I wonder if I could do that. So here's when I get asked a lot, and I'm sure you'll really resonate with this probably even more is how did you balance coming from an anti-racist perspective, joining, like getting into that biker culture, even being around black clubs, there's still like swastikas, SS bolts, a lot of like Nazi imagery. Um, you know, dudes, a lot of these kind of older biker dudes say stupid things. Like, how, how did you deal with that? Or how did you, how did you navigate through that? Uh, I, I opened my mind. I expanded. I, I, I quickly started. I tried to take the skinhead mindset into uh, the bike world with me. And it didn't, it didn't last. Like, okay, so this is a contradiction because we just talked about how there are these, the solidarity of the brotherhood and the community aspect is similar but the biker world is is deeper um and slower in that things aren't gonna there's been people doing it for generations longer than me and things move slow in terms of how the culture accepts new ways of thinking Absolutely. and i i had to understand like the ways these guys are thinking is informed by something much older and much bigger in terms of how many people are involved and so I got actually got into trouble thinking that some of my skinhead ties were going to resolve some of the issues that I encountered. And um, I caught because there were some other old skinhead homies that I knew that were in a club that was beefing with my club. And when it was time for me to uh, try to, re I was like, oh, I can squash this easy. And when I tried to do it, it was it didn't work. And it wasn't because they didn't. It wasn't their fault. It was just like everybody in between. Between right. me and them, there were these knuckleheads who just were like, no, all I told, all, all I know is there's a green light. And you couldn't talk sense to them, you know? And so that's when I realized, I was like, you know what? I love riding my bike, but the rules 
that are part of this world are taking the fun out of it for me. hundred you know? percent. It took yep. me a lot longer to figure that out. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I, I was in a club for, you know, 14, well, the same club for 14, but I did club stuff for about 16 years, but that's where I'm at now. Right. Like, I, like, I, you know, if, if, if you know, for my followers and, and, you know, you followed it as well, you know, moved on to this lift train ride thing and really just boiled down to same kind of thing you and your guys are doing is riding motorcycles and having fun with my boys, you know, like travel that you can respect and, and you know that they have, they have your back and you have theirs, but all the politics and drama out, outside of it. Indeed. And so I guess that brings me to, um, you guys have a pretty, like, what's the longest trip you did before this one you have coming up? Have you done any long road trips before? Nah, man. I mean, I've, I've only ridden five, six hours at a time. Okay. You know? So you're doing yeah. this born free run coming up uh, in a couple of weeks, right? Yeah, man. So this will be my first big run and doing it with the homie, Tom, Tom Tegner from, you know, old skinhead homie from back in the day, Portland Valdi, and then my boy, uh, Malcolm Shabazz Hoover. And this is actually his concept. You know, he invited me to be part of it. And then we were riding with Tom and we were like, Tom, you want to be part of this too? And so the three of us are riding down to Born Free. Got a camera crew rolling with us and um, we're going to capture it, edit it. And hopefully this fall I'll have our first episode. But we, yeah, we, we're trying to raise money to get the, you know, pay for all of us to get there and back. Awesome. Yeah, I'll put the GoFundMe link in the in down below in the captions. So what's the kind of idea or, or what's what's the, the whole meaning of what you guys are doing? So explain to the viewers that don't know about what you're putting together. So the, we're, we're using motorcycles as a platform to talk about race in this society. And, you know, we want to go. We want to. There's a lot of uh, misconceptions about bike culture. You know, the biker world there. Everybody's racist. Only white men. And the reality is it's more diverse than, than that stereotype. And so we want to center the people who don't fit that stereotype, you know, and, and share our platform and be like, what, what's it like being you and being the opposite of what so many people think is going on. And um, also talk to people that are white, that are part of the culture who have some, some of their own thoughts, like, we just want to get in honest conversations with people. And if people, if there are people out here who might not agree with my politics, I can still break bread and have a talk and learn something. And then we, we share that with the people and then we can all learn from it. So like Malcolm, he's like, I just want to show, I want to model how to have good converse, critical conversations about things that are hard for people to talk about in this country. That's awesome, man. I really like that a lot. I, li I like the aspect of combining it, like miles on the road with your brothers, having sh that shared, you know, mileage together and then meeting new people and those new connections. So it's, it's, you know, you're hitting different levels to it. And I think that's really cool. Right on. I'm really excited to see it. Yeah. I remember um, I had a conversation with a, a guy from the club I used to be in out here in the Midwest one time. And he, you know, he was a little more right wing than I. And, and I remember kind of, you know, like asking him you know, about his beliefs and stuff. And he kind of just looked at me and goes, hey, listen, dude, he goes, you know, he, he immigrated from another country. He's got a lot more life experience than I do or, or very different life experience than I do. And he goes, man, you're from the Northwest where there really wasn't black people. There wasn't, you know, a lot of racism outside of that. Um, and he said, I have a really different experience. And the way he, he put it to me a little more tactful than that, but the way he put it, it really made me take a step back. And like, you're right. You know what I mean? I, I, I grew up anti-racist in an area full of white people versus the people out here in the Midwest, Chicago, there is that you lived in. That's a whole different story, you know? So, so mm -hmm. riding around and talking to those people and hearing their history, I think is going to be super cool. Yeah, I agree, man. And I think like right now we're in an environment, you look at social media, people destroy relationships over opinions all the time. Absolutely. You know, and it's like, there's, let's remember that there's a way to be in community where everybody doesn't have to agree on everything, but we don't got to be shitty to each other either, you know? For sure. So what's, um, are you still like putting out music? So like, are you doing some of that stuff still? So there's been my, my songwriting and recording and releasing a new music has been kind of slow. Rebel Wise was the last project that I album that I uh, helped complete. I've got some stuff on the back burner, but so like there's the, it did happen here. Podcast became the, it did happen here book. Um, there's my memoir that I'm going to be done with in 2024. There's the Baldi's documentary, and there's a lot of projects related to this whole history of anti-racist organizing. Yeah. And uh, really. I've got an album that's kind of a reflection of all that, but I just got to get to it. Like, you know, time, man. 
Right. Oh, absolutely. And that's a lot of stuff. So, so for those that haven't seen it, there's is PBS did the Baldi's documentary, right? Right. And I, I know it's available on YouTube. Um, I watched it. I think it's awesome. And then can you explain a little bit about the, um, it happened here stuff? It did happen here is a podcast. So it did happen here. Podcast.com. I was doing a story where I was writing a book. I've been working on a book called black skinhead. Another book named black skinhead has come out since that has nothing to do with black skinheads. All right. So just, <laughs> I want to clear that up. And the author even was confronted and she like doubled down on her ignorance. So don't go to that one. I'm even thinking I might have to change the, yeah, the, okay. the yeah, to like the real black skinhead. So I'll figure yeah. it out. American but, black uh, skinhead or something. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was write, writing a book about that experience because I got offered a book deal to, to tell the story. And uh, while I was doing that, I was working at KBU and Aaron Yankee, the program director, said, hey, we, what do you think about taking some of the interviews you've been interviewing people, you know, for for your book and letting it be part of this podcast that I want to develop? I was like, what, what's the podcast? She's like, well, there's this, there's some money that's been set aside from a bequest, this woman who passed on and she left behind some money that had to be used for creating um, programming. So it was at the radio station programming to fight the religious right. So we're like, if we tell the story of the anti-fascist and anti-racist organizing, we can intersect that with this, what this money is for, because the religious right was part of the fascist movement. Right. And so we did this podcast where Aaron Yankee, Julie Perini, Alec Dunn, Selena Flores, and Mo Bowster, and the five of us became a production team. And it's a good podcast. It tells the story of what happened in Portland in the 80s that led to Mula Geta Sarag getting beat to death by members of Eastside White Pride in Southeast Portland in 1988. But it also tells the story, not just of that tragic, brutal murder, it tells the story of how the environment created the people who carried out that murder yeah. um and the response like how did people respond how did we who are anti-racist and anti-fascist organize a response to that so the podcast is doing well and then uh pm press offered us a book deal so the book just came out may 2nd very cool yeah i listened to the whole podcast and it was very powerful man i'm, I'm really looking forward to the book um thank you were you involved in political stuff before that or have you ever gotten to like other outside of just street level stuff have you ever gotten into like more political movement worked for like you know like you said before some of those anti-racist organizations then you know i know you've done some stuff on the radio mm -hmm. you ever got like involved in politics you know people often ask me they go have you ever considered running for office so i don't deal with electoral politics but the political consciousness is always part of my movement work and the when I say political consciousness, I'm just talking about looking at the root cause of this, the things that are the most oppressive and problematic in terms of our survival. For me, first, as black folks, black people, for people of color who've been subject, subjected to a historic set of conditions um, globally, but primarily what I'm talking about is what's happened in this country. Uh, as a result of this process where European settler colonialism uh, was engaged in genocide against first peoples in the Western hemisphere and the forced displacement of African people to become slave labor in the Western hemisphere. And that set into motion these, these economic and political and social and militaristic processes that lead to the world we have today. So I was taught from, a, I had people who reared me, older activists and thinkers, and they were like, you need to understand that what you're fighting when you're out here beating up Nazis is um, you're fighting a symptom, but that's not the root cause. Absolutely. And so they began, yeah, so they, they began to teach me and give me books and put me in study groups. And I started learning like the way that we act is often not the root cause of what's happening. For sure. So that work, doing that work and, and connecting the dots between a lot of different things has brought me to Africa and, you know, five countries in Africa help. I built the help build a computer center in, in Burundi, Central Africa. And I'm about to go to Tanzania again, you know, for like the fifth time. Um, 
in a couple of weeks. I just helped some indigenous Maasai comrades, you know, buy some land over there. So it's the first land I've helped buy in Africa. And part of that land is mine now because I helped the community awesome. purchase it. And uh, I got involved in work got involved in work in Africa back in 2004 when I went to a conference in Rwanda. My activism got me invited out there and I uh, was able to help some local people do some powerful things by, by channeling resources from the West to them. And they opened a computer center in Burundi, which is neighboring country of Rwanda and have like educated like hundreds of young people, making them computer literate and giving them a fighting chance, you know? And so that got me invited to tour Zimbabwe, Tanzania, South Africa, and Kenya as a hip hop artist, collaborating with a lot of African hip hop artists. And so it's like, it's political, but it's also cultural. I get to do what I love. I get to do my music. I get to be involved in things that improve people's lives. So I, I love it, man. Yeah, and there's so much overlap compared to like how you were brought up, where you lived, your, your, your culture, your history. So that's really cool, man. Well, right on. Well, before we wrap up, is there anything you want to give sh any shout outs to? Um, so I know, like I said, we are, we'll drop the links to all of your stuff. You've pretty much brought up most of it. But is there anything that we missed that you want to give any shout outs to? Any projects you're working on or anything? Nah, I think we covered it. You know, the Crenshaw Shabazz and the homie Tom is the most current thing. Uh, look out for my book, whatever it's going to be <laughs> called sometime in 2024 check out the podcast and it uh it did happen here podcast.com get the book from pm press it did happen here and follow me on socials you know i'm i'm really messing with the only ones i'm on heavy right now is instagram and i my twitter game is like so lagging but mike crenshaw m-i-c-c-r-e-n-s-h-a-w awesome all right well we're gonna wrap up um, all right everyone thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you next time peace y'all